Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. Turkey declares a three-month state of emergency as another earthquake rocks the region. That's after Monday's twin earthquakes caused devastation. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says an increase in the debt ceiling is possible, but it must be responsible. He added that the runaway spending of the last few years is over. Twitter users are reacting to a song from a Disney cartoon. The song says that descendants of slaves in America deserve reparations and that President Lincoln didn't actually free the slaves. The specifics on the size and cargo of the Chinese spy balloon, warnings it may have been used as a dry run for an EMP attack, and expert analysis on the balloon's most likely type of information gathering. Turkey was hit by another five-plus magnitude earthquake earlier today. That follows yesterday's massive twin quakes that collapsed entire buildings and led to over 5,000 deaths in Turkey and Syria. We have received offers of assistance from 70 different countries and 14 international organizations. We spoke with 18 heads of state and government who called us on the phone. I would like to thank all of our friends who called, sent messages, and released statements to convey their support and offer of help in this difficult day of our country. President Tayyip Erdogan declared a three-month state of emergency covering Turkey's 10 southern provinces. He called the area a disaster zone and a movement to bolster rescue efforts. Declaring a state of emergency permits the president and cabinet to bypass parliament to enact new laws and to limit or suspend rights and freedoms as they deem necessary. The state of emergency would end shortly before presidential and parliamentary elections. It could also be extended. The newest quake was recorded at around 1 p.m. local time in eastern Turkey. Its epicenter was 18 miles from one of yesterday's quakes. Erdogan said Turkey plans to open hotels in a tourism hub to house people impacted temporarily. The World Health Organization warns that the death toll could rise to around 20,000 in the coming days. Overwhelmed rescuers are struggling to save people trapped under the rubble as the death toll from the devastating earthquakes continues to climb. And just a warning, some viewers may find the following disturbing. As dawn broke over the Syrian city of Aleppo on Tuesday, a desperate search was on for survivors of a devastating earthquake. The magnitude 7.8 quake struck Turkey and Syria in the early hours of Monday causing entire apartment blocks to crumble to dust and crushing families to death as they slept. The death toll is in the thousands and is expected to rise further as hundreds remain trapped. In the southern Turkish province of Hatay, a man said he could hear the voice of a woman screaming for help under the rubble. The body of a man lay lifeless beside him. Nearby, another local resident, who gave his name as Denise, was in despair as he says his family are trapped but nobody is coming to help. Rescue efforts have been hampered by freezing temperatures. North of Hattay, entire families gather around fires and wrap themselves in blankets to stay warm. Thousands of people have been left homeless or injured after the disaster. Drone footage of the region showed the sheer level of destruction caused. In Syria, a similar level of devastation has been compounded by more than 11 years of civil war. Even before the earthquake struck, more than 4 million people in the northwest of the country were living in camps and depended on cross-border aid. Help from abroad is slowly beginning to arrive, with teams from Serbia, Germany, Romania and Spain landing in southern Turkey on Tuesday. They brought with them rescue equipment, including dogs to assist the search for survivors more has been pledged. Monday's earthquake was the biggest recorded worldwide by the US Geological Survey since the tremor in the remote South Atlantic in August 2021. The earthquake that struck Turkey and Syria yesterday came from a rupture more than 60 miles long. Seismologists say it's likely to be one of the deadliest this decade. Here's why. Seismologists say Monday's magnitude 7.8 earthquake that hit Turkey and Syria is probably going to be one of the deadliest this decade. Only two others from 2013 to 2022 were of the same magnitude. 
compared to the 6.2 quake that hit Italy in 2016 and killed some 300 people. The Turkey-Syria earthquake released 250 times as much energy, according to one expert. So why was it so bad? The epicenter of the quake was in the Turkish province of Gaziantep and at the relatively shallow depth of about 11 miles on the East Anatolian Fault. It then radiated towards the northeast, bringing devastation to central Turkey and Syria. The severity was due to the fact that the East Anatolian Fault is a strike-slip fault. In those, solid rock plates are pushing up against each other across a vertical fault line, building stress until one slips in a horizontal motion, which releases a tremendous amount of strain. That, in turn, can trigger an earthquake. The San Andreas Fault in California is one of the world's most famous strike-slip faults. In Monday's quake, there was a more than 62-mile rupture between the Anatolian and Arabian plates. 11 minutes after the initial quake, the region was hit by a 6.7 magnitude aftershock. A 7.5 magnitude quake came hours later, followed by another spasm in the afternoon. Experts say activity is spreading to neighboring faults, and seismicity may continue for a while. Monday's quake already has the highest death toll in Turkey since 1999. That year, a tremor of similar magnitude struck a region near Istanbul and killed more than 17,000 people. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is rallying public support for a responsible increase in the nation's debt ceiling. In an address to the nation yesterday, he also called for a cut in federal spending. And today's Daniel Monahan has more. But at the end of the day, we're going to get spending reform. <clears throat> McCarthy described the national debt as the greatest threat to the country's future. Our national debt is high, too high. He says it eclipses inflation, illegal immigration, and China's infiltration of our culture. The government has consistently operated on a deficit budget for over 50 years. That makes it necessary to borrow continually to pay the nation's bills. The debt ceiling is the total amount of debt the government is authorized by Congress to hold at one time. It is currently at just over $31 trillion. Congress must raise the limit if that ceiling is reached, or the federal government will begin to default on some of its obligations. McCarthy called for attacking what he called runaway federal spending. He is advocating for spending cuts and called on President Biden to join in the effort. A responsible debt limit increase that begins to eliminate wasteful Washington spending and puts us on a path towards a balanced budget is not only the right place to start, it's the only place to start. McCarthy assured Americans there would be no default on the nation's financial obligations and no threat to Social Security or Medicare. The United States would have reached the debt ceiling in January. Special measures taken by U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen postponed the default until June. The national debt has risen at a rapid rate since 1982. It has doubled approximately every seven years under the leadership of both parties. Meanwhile, Representative Kevin Hearn has outlined the policies Republicans are discussing in connection with debt ceiling negotiations. Those include rollbacks on non-essential spending, a cap on future spending, and paid-for tax cuts. Paid-for tax cuts are intended to have a neutral or positive effect on the budget. The theory is they will stimulate economic activity, thereby generating at least as much new tax revenue as was lost. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. President Biden will be giving the State of the Union address tonight. It will be his second since taking office. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more on what the president is likely to convey in his speech. Biden is expected to tout the low unemployment rate, slowing inflation, and the January jobs report that produced better-than-expected numbers. Outgoing National Economic Council Director Brian Deese says the president will address a broad array of economic issues in his speech and that the president's key objective will be telling Americans that the state of the economy is strong. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reported last week that 517,000 new jobs were created in January, more than doubling market estimates. The U.S. recorded unemployment rate also fell to its lowest level in 53 years at 3.4%. One thing you're going to hear directly from the president, that a core part of any viable economic strategy needs to answer the question of how are you going to keep lowering costs for families. The president will outline specific ideas on how to do that. Deese says Biden will present his administration's progress in the broader frame of growing the economy through a bottom-up, middle-out economic strategy. 
instead of embracing trickle-down economics. But many recent polling figures suggest plenty of Americans are skeptical of what the White House is reporting. A new poll by ABC News and The Washington Post revealed 41% of Americans say they have become worse off financially since Biden took office. 42% reported that their finances have been about the same. Inflation remains at a four-decade high. The Federal Reserve has increased rates eight times in the last year as it strives to avoid a recession. And Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell has indicated that he's not done with rate hikes, citing a goal to keep decreasing inflation. Biden is facing scrutiny over the response to the Chinese spy balloon that recently crossed the U.S. Many Republicans are criticizing the decision not to shoot it down sooner. We've made it clear to China what we're going to do. They understand our position. We're not going to back off. We did the right thing. And there's not a bad question of weakening or strengthening. It's just the reality. Biden is also expected to address the debt ceiling, immigration, and the war in Ukraine. Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders will be giving the GOP response to Biden's address. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. NTD will live broadcast President Biden's State of the Union address tonight from 8 p.m. to 10.45 p.m. Eastern Time. Now on to updates and analysis on the Chinese spy balloon. The military has released specifics about its size and what it was and may have been carrying. And we hear from an expert about its most likely purpose. Joining us now to discuss is retired senior intelligence officer specializing in China, Nicholas F. Timiatis. He's now a professor of Homeland Security at Penn State University. It's really great having you with us today, Nicholas. Thank you for having me. An expert is warning that the Chinese spy balloon recently shot down could have been used as a dry run for an attack. That's according to Paul Crespo, the president of the Center for American Defense Studies. Those could be electromagnetic pulse or EMP attacks. What can you tell us about this balloon in terms of the risk to national security? Well, uh, the, the most likely is that it was an intelligence collection mission at this point. Uh, you know, there are lots of ways to determining that, not the least of which is all the equipment on board and its capabilities, the altitudes it was keeping, et cetera. Uh, there are certainly possibilities for destructive actions. There's EMP, there's biological release agents, all those types of things are, are possibilities as well. We're really not going to know um, a lot more until we analyze the actual equipment that was on board. Um, we're going to assume at this point it was an intelligence collection mission because of the station keeping that the balloon did over Montana, uh, which shows that they have positive control over it. Uh, and the, you know, uh, theoretically for the U.S. to openly declare it was an intelligence asset, they probably intercepted some communications from this, uh, from this balloon as well. So they know what it was collecting. That's a very good update that you give us the possibilities here. The NORAD commander said the balloon was up to 200 feet tall, weighed a couple thousand pounds, and said without evidence it may have been carrying explosives, maybe for self-destruction, and had a device hanging from it about the size of a small jet. What can you tell us about the capabilities of a balloon like this? Well, uh, the balloons get larger as they go up, right, because there's less atmospheric pressure. So they could start out 50, 60, 70, 80 feet across, and then by the time they're at 100,000 feet, they're the size of several school buses, right, because they expand. Uh, so typically you have, depending on the collection mission, uh, you have the type of apparatus that you need. I noticed that it had solar panels, so it was obviously something that was designed to be kept up for months at a time. Uh, you know, uh, uh, photos or taking a high, high reconnaissance, you know, highly accurate photos probably isn't, you know, worth sending something over, you know, to another country, right? China can do that with satellites. They don't need to take high resolution photos from a balloon. So they're probably collecting um, radio signals that don't penetrate the atmosphere. You know, so they're dipping down into the atmosphere and collecting radio signals from military bases. There's also the likelihood is that they're collecting transmissions from military bases to satellites. And even if the transmissions are encrypted, that's fine. You know, people, we soak up 30 years of, of, of transmissions from countries just on the expectation we'll be able to break the, the encryption. And I'm the, us, the Russians, everyone, they just soak up all the encrypted data because someday they're going to break that. And they're going to be able to look back and understand everything that happened and capabilities and development and even project forward. So that the, is very interesting that you point that out, Nicholas, about the capabilities of this beyond what satellites can do. What would the U.S. do in response to this balloon situation if they found out about it in terms of just I mean, like false signals or something? 
Sure. All major countries have do not have um, uh, satellite warning programs and denial and deception programs that go along with them. So, you know, when a satellite passes overhead, typically any country, they button up and they put the uh, airplanes in the hangars. They take the personnel off the tarmac, you know, so they don't reveal how many people are there and how many, uh, you know, how many airplanes and what type of condition, those types of things. Uh, you know, we've probably spent thousands and thousands of photos between Russia and the United States taking the pictures of tops of, of hangars and missile silos and things like that, uh, just waiting for the one time somebody slips up. Uh, so that is a denial portion of the program. If you want to deceive your opponents, which nation do, nations do all the time, they put out fake things, they put out fake planes, they put out, you know, they surge in the number of people they have in one area. They build mock-ups as China does routinely when they do exercises, uh, you know, towards Taiwan, and they put mock-ups of a, of a Taiwan air base or something like that. Now, they know satellites are looking at it, but they do this to send a message that, hey, this could be for real now, we're serious about it. So it's called denial deception, and it's done to manipulate your opponent into thinking in a direction that you want. Very good to have your analysis on this spy balloon. Retired senior intelligence officer specializing in China, Nicholas F. Timyatis, it is great having you with us today. Thank you so much. Coming up, states are now taking a bigger role in policymaking for abortion access. We take a look at a state that wants to support financially centers that offer alternatives. We have that and more just after this break. A scene from a children's cartoon is making waves online. The cartoon contains a song that some say spreads anti-white propaganda. This country was built- A reboot of the cartoon The Proud Family is airing on Disney's streaming service Disney+. Plus. This scene from an episode talking about slavery and reparations is now being shared by many online. The descendants of slaves continue to build this. Slaves built this country. And we, the descendants of slaves in America, have earned reparations for their suffering. And continue to earn reparations every moment we spend submerged in the systemic prejudice, racism, and white, white supremacy that America was founded with and still has not atoned for. Slaves. A popular Twitter account called End Wokeness shared the clip, describing it as blatant anti-white propaganda. Manhattan Institute fellow Christopher Rufo says this Disney clip is pure critical race theory, including the insane conspiracy theory that Lincoln did not free the slaves. The song in the cartoon says Lincoln didn't free the slaves because slaves can only free themselves. Now a previous clip of Latoya Raveno, the show's executive producer, is being shared online. I don't have to be afraid to like, let's have these two characters kiss, let's in the background, this, like I was just Wherever I could, just basically adding queerness to, like, the, if you see anything queer in the show, I'm proud of them. But, like, I, I just was like, no one would stop me. And in the clip, she says she has a not-so-secret gay agenda. There are also some who support the controversial clip. This user, who got thousands of views, hosted the clip, saying, To celebrate Black History Month Day, let me share this awesome clip from Proud Family Louder and Prouder. Happy Black History Month. NTD reached out to Disney for comment, but didn't immediately hear back. Florida is set to dissolve Disney's special self-governing status. Republican lawmakers have introduced a bill that would end it. It would also create a board to run the Disney district. The governor would appoint the board. The legislation would allow the state to tax Disney for possible road projects outside the district's boundaries. And it would ensure that Disney, not the taxpayers, pays $700 million in debt. Authorities say it would also prevent Disney from getting more land through eminent domain, and it would compel Disney to chip in for local infrastructure. The Florida legislature created the district in 1967. Disney reacted to the bill. They say they are watching its progress and called the bill complex, citing the long history of the Disney district. Last year's overturning of Roe v. Wade has led to many changes in abortion access. One such change is states taking control of policymaking. And today's Daniel Monahan brings us more. Democrat-controlled cities and states are funding efforts to provide access to abortion, while states led by Republicans are seeking new ways to support centers that provide alternatives. Our services are free, confidential, and professional. Kansas voters affirmed abortion access in an August 2022 vote. 
The state's Republican-controlled legislature has now sprung into action. It is considering millions of dollars in state funds for centers that provide alternatives. Insight Women's Center is located in Lawrence, Kansas. Bridget Smith serves as its executive director. Regardless of the decision, we want them to know that they're not walking through this alone. According to their website, they are a faith-based organization. Their stated aim is to empower women to confidently choose life for their baby. They offer free pregnancy testing and ultrasounds. Insight Women's Center has literally helped me all throughout uh, my whole pregnancy. They took my first sonogram here, um, and hearing that heartbeat is sort of just uh, melted our hearts into keeping him. They also provide counseling and help women who decide to keep their babies get ready for the big change. Not only are we educating them on parenting and life skills, um, even helping them with some of the heart healing and the trauma, the, the um, trauma healing that they need. The center sets women up with the same volunteer once a week to help build a relationship with them. They say the volunteers become emotional support that the women may not have in their life. The center also offers clients supplies in exchange for baby bucks they get for doing classes. If they come to the education mentoring classes, they could earn everything they need, not what they want maybe, but everything they need for the first year of the baby's life. So we try to help set them up so that realistically and practically they can raise that child. Supporters appreciate the effort to financially support the centers. They say it shows the pro-life movement is taking concrete steps to meet women's needs, both social and financial. I would not change anything. Uh, I've always wanted a son, firstborn son. However, critics say the efforts fall short of what's necessary. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. New York City is ending its vaccine mandate for city employees. Mayor Eric Adams made the announcement yesterday. Adams said that since more than 96% of the city's workers have received the COVID vaccine, it's the right moment for the decision. The city will also end vaccination requirements for staff at non-public schools and daycares. The mandate will end on Friday if the decision is approved, as expected, at the upcoming City Board of Health meeting. The union representing New York City's 36,000 police officers welcomed the decision, but they say the job is only half done. Union head Patrick Lynch is calling on the city to reinstate fired officers without condition and with back pay. Mayor Adams said the city workers who were fired will not automatically get their jobs back. The nearly 1,800 teachers, firefighters, and police officers will have to reapply for their positions. Unions representing city workers are planning to sue the city for pay to compensate for time lost. Across the country, in California, State Assemblyman Juan Alanis hopes to tackle the state's rising crime rate. He's proposed a bill to repeal a law seen as soft on crime. Proposition 47 was passed by voters in 2014. It raised the felony threshold for theft in retail stores from $400 to $950, limited jail time for misdemeanors to a maximum of six months, and reduced some drug-related crimes from felonies to misdemeanors. The bill was part of an effort to alleviate prison crowding, but it has faced criticism for an increase in crime, particularly property theft, across the state's largest cities since it passed. The new bill would roll back most of the statutes of Proposition 47. Polls indicate that two-thirds of California voters want to either repeal or substantially modify Proposition 47. Turning to a Coast Guard rescue, a crab boat sank Sunday near southwest Washington. Two crew members were rescued, but one is still missing. Night vision video from the U.S. Coast Guard captured rescuers hoisting two people from a life raft onto the helicopter. The operation started around 8 p.m. on Sunday. Weather remained rough during this time. The Seattle Times said the crab boat signaled its sinking at about 7.30 p.m. Search crews later found the wreckage of the vessel in nearby waters. Efforts to locate the third crew member continue by air and sea, as well as along the coastline. United Airlines has been hit with a proposed fine of more than a million dollars over a pre-flight safety check for its Boeing 777 planes that was not allegedly being performed. The Federal Aviation Administration says United did away with the fire system warning check that was a requirement and that as a result, the planes flying from June 2018 to April 2021 were, quote, not in airworthy condition. United did not immediately respond to a request for comment. They have 30 days to respond to the FAA. 
An official familiar with the matter said the airplane dropped the check, the airline dropped the check, when United consolidated its pre-flight safety check procedures for its 777s and 787s. The official said a 787 computer performs the check automatically. And still to come, a memorial event in New York City evoked memories of a whistleblower who first reported the COVID-19 pandemic in Wuhan three years ago. Participants said they refused to forget. And a Chinese police station in downtown New York has been shut down. It was one of Beijing's vast network of outposts across the world. We'll have the details soon when we return. The 2023 State of the Union Address on NTD Television at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. A performance that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. The Fixture Pioneer, CGF. Professional AI intelligent fixtures. All-round integration of four systems. High precision, high durability, high quality. Two micrometer repetition accuracy. More than 80 patent certificates. ISO 9001 approved. Precision clamping to meet your every need. CGF has it all. Pride of Taiwan, CGM. Refuse to forget, refuse to forgive. That's the motto for a commemorative event in New York held over the weekend. Attendees said they refused to forget the first whistleblower who sounded the alarm about the COVID-19 pandemic in Wuhan, Dr. Li Wenliang, as well as others who died of the virus. What's more, they say they won't forgive the Chinese Communist Party for what its handling of the virus caused over the last three years. Tuesday marks the third anniversary of Li Wenliang's death. Several similar events also took place in other cities. Entity's Ke Ting Ting has more. Here on 96th Street on the west side of New York Central Park, there is a bench commemorating Dr. Li Wenliang. On the third anniversary of his death, people can be seen coming here one after another to send flowers in mourning. A quote from Li Wenliang is engraved on the bench. A healthy society should not have only one voice. First, we want to express condolences to people who died of the virus. We won't forget them. Second, we'll never give up and never forgive the CCP's tyranny. Li Wenliang was one of the doctors who first sounded the alarm three years ago over the dangers of the CCP virus, which causes COVID-19. At that time, it was known only as an unknown pneumonia spreading in Wuhan. Dr. Lee was quickly silenced by police and later died of the virus on February 7, 2020. When many people see the disasters in Chinese history, they often didn't understand why such things could happen. But after experiencing the pandemic in the past three years, we can see that under the Chinese communist regime, all kinds of human tragedies are possible. In Los Angeles, around 50 people gathered outside the city's Chinese consulate to mourn Li Wenliang. A man attacked the event and was later arrested by police. Event participants say he's a Chinese student. Similar events have been held in San Francisco, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Germany, and France. Beijing outposts around the world are doing police work on behalf of the Chinese regime. There are several locations here in the U.S., however, one of them has just been shut down. Entity's Tiffany Meyer has the story. 
the U.S. shutting down a Chinese police station in the heart of New York City. The State Department confirmed the news to the National Review. A staff member from the police station also verified the statement. We have halted our operations. The U.S. government told us we can't stay open. There are still two other stations open on American soil. One is in Los Angeles, the other in an unknown location. NTD reached out to the FBI and the State Department for more. The FBI declined to comment. The State Department said it had no further information to share at this time. Beijing operates a network of over 100 similar police outposts around the world. Chinese authorities say the offices help overseas Chinese with passport services. While human rights groups say they help Beijing harass and track down dissidents, Ireland and the Netherlands have ordered outposts in their territories to close. More than 10 countries have started investigations into the issue. First, harsh lockdowns, then a chaotic U-turn. Beijing's COVID-19 strategies are making Chinese people reflect and take a step in a new direction. Crowds of Chinese Americans joined in a rally in Los Angeles last week. They are calling on people to sever ties with the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. The Chinese people have had enough. They are waking up. Many of them riled by the party's mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic. While authorities claim the outbreak has ended, videos posted online tell a different story. Among the attendees, one said he knew China's communist authorities were downplaying the situation because his wife worked as a nurse in a Wuhan hospital. He urged people to draw a line in the sand with the CCP. For those of you in mainland China, if you realize the evil nature of the party, I suggest you do not join those CCP-related organizations and do not let your children join them. I love China too, but I hate the Communist Party. Apart from a ruling party, the CCP has other affiliated organizations, including the Youth League and the Young Pioneers. They are state-run groups that aim to teach Chinese children allegiance to the party. The Communist Party has caused so much suffering and disaster to the Chinese people that we should not forgive. So whether we were or are members of the Young Pioneers, the Youth League, or the party, as long as we're in line with the values of normal human beings, we should refuse to be part of them. Other attendees urged people to take a closer look at the party's history. The Solomon Islands national government has removed a political hurdle standing in the way of closer ties with the Chinese Communist Party. Daniel Suedani, the premier of the most populous province in the Solomon Islands, was ousted from office. Around 17 assembly members voted for his removal. Suedani attempted to file an appeal in the high court, but the assembly denied receiving any notice. Scuffles erupted outside the provincial assembly in protest. The Royal Solomon Islands police force fired tear gas into the crowd. In an earlier attempt to oust Suedani, locals physically blocked the entrance of the parliament. Suedani has been at odds with the national government since its decision to switch diplomatic ties from Taiwan to Beijing in 2019. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And just ahead, what is driving up energy prices in Europe? Our reporter spoke to the former chief of a major gas company in France. And a German village is turning down a government plan to house refugees nearby, citing security hazards. More short here on NTD News Today. Poland is taking steps to strengthen its defensive capabilities as Russia's war in neighboring Ukraine enters its second year this month. Poland acquired Patriot missiles from the U.S. last year. They have been deployed to the country's capital, Warsaw. Poland's defense ministry says the deployment is part of military exercises. At least three ground-to-air missile launchers were seen yesterday at Warsaw's Benovo Airport. The Minister of Defense said the redeployment of the missile batteries from their base in central Poland was an important element of training. The Patriot batteries are part of Poland's multi-billion dollar armaments purchases from the U.S., South Korea, and elsewhere. Russia's defense minister says NATO is being dragged into the Ukraine conflict. The issue is Western arms supplies to the country. He warns this could lead to an unpredictable escalation. 
The defense minister accused the U.S. and allies of openly urging Ukraine to seize their territories. He was reportedly referring to four regions in eastern and southern Ukraine. Those are Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. Russia claims it annexed them following referendums last September. Much of the territory in the Russian-claimed regions remains in Ukrainian hands. Ukraine says the weapons, including tanks, are urgently needed. They want to repel Russian attacks. They also want to boost firepower for a spring offensive against Moscow's forces. Ukrainian officials say Moscow is planning a renewed assault in the coming weeks. A 200 percent import tariff on Russian-made aluminum? That's what the United States is considering. The goal would be to ramp up pressure on Moscow over its war in Ukraine. No announcement about any tariff increases is expected this week. The U.S. has taxed Russian aluminum before when Moscow dumped the metal on the U.S. market below cost. The Biden administration also discussed restrictions on imports of Russian aluminum in October. That was in response to Moscow's military escalation in Ukraine. The White House declined to comment on potential new tariffs or other restrictions. Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, was once a member of the KGB. That's according to two Swiss media outlets. The publications say the patriarch was among supporters of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In the 1970s, he represented Moscow at the World Council of Churches in Geneva. His alleged mission was to infiltrate the organization, meaning steer it to condemn America and its allies and to moderate criticism of the Soviet Union's lack of religious freedom. The patriarch's nephew and successor said his uncle, quote, was not an agent, even if he was subject to the KGB's strict control. As gas and electricity bills keep rising, the French government looks to shield consumers from skyrocketing prices. And today's France correspondent David Vives spoke with the former president of a major French gas company. He says European governments still haven't addressed the true causes of the energy crisis. In France, millions of households are expected to see electricity bills go up by 15%. The hike follows a jump in gas prices about one month ago. Many have blamed the Ukraine war as one of the main reasons for rising energy costs. But for some experts, this explanation is not more than a scapegoat. Loïc lefroc Prigent is a former president of a major French gas company and has been working in the energy sector for decades. He says skyrocketing energy prices are mainly caused by speculation on the energy market, which he calls an artificial market. Gas prices in Europe went up before the war in Ukraine, three years ago already, so that American shale gas prices could make American shale gas profitable. That's what it was about. It had nothing to do with the war in Ukraine, as you can see. He also says many weren't aware of Germany's dependence on Russian gas, which has impacted gas prices on the European market. This lie led to all the others. The next lie was that Germany was self-sufficient by using solar and wind power. This was not true. Its self-sufficiency was powered by Russian gas. That was it. And so when you talk about wind power in Germany, you're actually talking about Russian gas. Gas is used to generate heat but also for electricity production, which explains how gas and electricity costs are linked. The situation is similar across Europe. Prices of electricity and gas vary from one country to another, as each country's energy mix is different. Le Floc Prigent says that when it comes to electricity, it's impossible for governments to implement price caps as a long-term measure to help consumers. The idea of the government capping prices is an illusion, because this does not take into account the fact that electricity is an ephemeral product. That means that production must be equivalent to consumption at all times, and that it cannot be stored. The electricity market is completely artificial and has led to a situation in which there is a lack of electricity. In this market, there are suppliers who are neither producers, nor distributors, nor transporters, but are in fact parasites. And it's these parasites that engage in speculation on the futures market, which leads to an electricity market that is erratic. In other words, the rules on the electricity market don't work in favor of consumers. Le Floc Prigent says energy companies should aim for a fair and guaranteed price for energy, and this guaranteed price should guide investments in the energy market. 
To invest in electricity production, whether it's nuclear, gas or coal, perhaps over a period of 10, 20, 40 or 50 years, you have to provide a guaranteed tariff for the consumer. But it's on this guaranteed tariff that we build the financing plan for investments. This is true for Hinkley Point today in England. It's true for investments in Finland and in California. And this guaranteed tariff is not insured when you have an artificial market. For some time now, no major electricity production infrastructures have been built. This leads to the situation today when it's hard to prevent shortages. So we are heading towards more shortages because there are no more investments. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. In a village in northern Germany, residents are protesting a government plan to house hundreds of asylum seekers in their neighborhood. A meeting at the Upal Town Hall stirred up anger among residents of the northern German village. Officials plan to build a container village next to their homes for 400 refugees, mainly asylum seekers from Syria and Afghanistan. Too many nationalities are coming all at once. They're all sitting around, bored. Bus connections have to be set up, doctors. Everything has to be organized. How quickly can the police intervene if something happens? Or the security company that works there? That's a bit worrying. One resident voiced her concerns about security. She said 150 of the 500 villagers are elderly, some of them women living alone. We have many kids, we have families, and most of the young people leave the village in the morning to go to work. So we are alone. Young mothers with their children, the elderly, we are alone. We won't feel safe leaving the house anymore. She added that young immigrants will have little to do due to the lack of facilities in the community. Then, of course, fears emerged. 500 young men in a village where there is no infrastructure. What do they want to spend their time doing there? Our young people have to leave the village here for sports or entertainment or whatever. We are a sleepy village. Fine. I chose this myself eight years ago. I wasn't born here. It's a nice village, a quiet village, a nice neighborhood, but no infrastructure. This meeting was the first time local residents learned about the resettlement plan. Many felt themselves victims of an unconsulted decision. The district chief administrator admitted that the plan was made under time pressure. More than 240,000 people applied for asylum in Germany last year. That's almost 28 percent higher than the year before. The number doesn't include refugees from Ukraine. Just ahead, Mexico ranks as one of the most dangerous countries for journalists. In the past year alone, 13 journalists have been killed on Mexican soil. And El Salvador is more than doubling its art incarceration capacity. Authorities are opening a new prison that can hold a whopping 40,000 people. Stay tuned for more on that when we return. We're entering an unprecedented period of economic turmoil. The economy is unstable, our government is in shambles, and the global war on energy has created a domestic crisis. Americans need a way to protect their financial future. One way to ensure your wealth in retirement is by purchasing physical gold and silver. We can help. You can roll any part of your retirement account into a gold or silver IRA. Better yet, you can open a gold or silver IRA in five minutes or less using our online application. Preserving your family's financial legacy is a choice that's always available to you. And when you're ready, we're here to help. Call us and speak to one of our IRA professionals. Let's build your financial legacy together. GSI Exchange, wealth for generations to come. Welcome back. Mexico is now the most dangerous country for reporters in the world outside the war in Ukraine. That's according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, a New York-based rights group. This is part of Mexico's Interoceanic Corridor, one of President López Obrador's mega-projects designed to develop the south of the country. It includes work on a breakwater at Salina Cruz in Oaxaca. 
This coastal area has a reputation as a landing spot for precursor chemicals to make fentanyl and meth. It's also the backdrop to a news story about a local politician's alleged efforts to win re-election and the shooting dead of the reporter who wrote it. Mourned by his family, Ever Lopez Vasquez is one of 13 journalists killed in Mexico in 2022, the deadliest year on record for the nation's newsrooms. He'd published a story on Facebook accusing local politician Arminda Espinosa Cartas of corruption. Her brother was one of the two men arrested, but no one was charged over Lopez's murder. Espinosa herself did not respond to Reuters' requests for comment. Since Lopez's death, fellow journalists say they are more afraid to publish stories delving into the Corridor Project or ones touching on drug trafficking and state collusion with organized crime. We'll keep on informing, but the most important thing is to stay alive. There are definitely issues you cannot address. You cannot address the topic of presidents connected to organized crime. You cannot address the topic of insecurity in the region of the interoceanic corridor. We all know the organized crime sells in the sand, the gravel, the rods, the cement. They are in charge of construction, of carrying the stones, of everything. You cannot address those issues because they could cost you your life. Hiram Moreno knows the risks. He was shot three times in 2019 and now has a panic button issued by a government body known as The Mechanism, set up to protect journalists. But Moreno has little faith in its effectiveness. The Mechanism is not the solution to guarantee the safety of any journalists in Mexico. They have not done and they will not do it because there are elements and resources to do so. What the current government lacks is the will to guarantee the safety of all the journalists who are at risk. We are not special people. We are not agents of change. We inform. We are messengers. We are the ones who allow democracy and security to prevail partially. In this country, there is no security. Since 2017, nine reporters enrolled in the mechanism have been murdered, according to a rights group. An investigation by Mexico's Human Rights Commission found evidence of multiple failings by the authorities. Interior Ministry official Enrique Irazoque said the mechanism accepted those findings, but he highlighted the local lack of action and political will. The truth is that the mechanism is absorbing all the problems, he said, but the issues are not federal, they are local. Mexican politicians can also be quick to accuse reporters of corruption. Muy hipócritas, muy deshonestos. The president frequently chastises reporters who publish stories painting his administration negatively. He condemns the murderers while accusing adversaries of talking up the death toll to discredit him. The president's office did not respond to requests for comment. Since the start of Mexico's drug war in 2006, upwards of 133 reporters like Eber López Vázquez are estimated to have been killed. That and the staggering 360,000 other homicides registered in that time is taking its toll on all Mexicans, according to Balbina Flores from Reporters Without Borders. Society pays the cost. There is a society that gets used to a situation of violence and to feeling more vulnerable. The people in those areas say that if that happens to a journalist who works for a news outlet and who works to inform, what could happen to citizens? Staying in Mexico, authorities are trying to maintain order in prisons. They are destroying various objects that inmates secretly smuggled in. We have done this with tons and tons of trash that were taken from inside the prison to bring order. It's how a prison should work. Today we are working on that and things are flowing. Nevertheless, we've only been working on this for seven days. The objects range from TVs and heaters to statues of the Santa Muerte or Holy Death. Authorities destroyed the items, the seized items, with a roller. This happened at the Cerezo III prison in Ciudad Juarez, across the border from El Paso, Texas. Chihuahua's state security minister said objects and people were being sneaked into the prison through a small door. The door led to the prison's exterior and bypassed all security and inspection filters. It was not covered by any security cameras. Navy, state, and federal police have been deployed to the prison to maintain order. In early January, a riot, left the pri- a riot at the prison left 14 dead. And speaking of prisons, authorities in El Salvador have opened one of Latin America's largest prisons. The country's prison population is soaring amid the government crackdown on criminal gangs. 
The Terrorism Confinement Center was inaugurated last week. It can hold 40,000 inmates, more than doubling the country's incarceration capacity. The facility is aimed to help relieve some of the overpopulation in the prison system. Since last March, El Salvador authorities have arrested more than 62,000 suspected gang members and their collaborators. Here we are going to guarantee that all these people who for decades have caused harm and murdered Salvadoran families will be in a place where they will not be able to leave. Every single cell has been built according to international standards. The entire prison has been built in compliance with international standards and guarantees security. El Salvador has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Nearly 2% of the nation's adult population is behind bars. Its largest prison currently holds 33,000 people, despite having a capacity of 10,000. El Salvador authorities said the new prison spans over 410 acres. 600 troops and 250 police officers will secure it. And coming up, from heartfelt sorrow to jubilance. That's how audience members of the Shen Yun describe the show. We'll see what the Nashville audience had to say after the break here on NTD News. And a huge martial arts ceremony in Thailand breaks the record for the largest ceremony of its type. We'll be back with more soon. A show of classical Chinese dance is inspiring audiences around the world. Shen Yun Performing Arts recently made a stop at Nashville, Tennessee, where NTD spoke with people who got to see the show. Shen Yun Performing Arts held three performances in Nashville, Tennessee in early February. Here's what the audience had to say. Oh, it has been amazing. It's uh, visually stunning. The athleticism of the dancers is truly impressive. An amazing story and the music that accompanies it is absolutely beautiful. I I could not be more impressed. Oh my goodness, the performance is amazing. You know, I've actually wanted to see this for several years. But how they incorporate dance into just the, the storytelling. You know, nobody is standing around, right? Everybody is always making a move that's expressive, that expresses what's in their heart, in their mind, what they're going to do next. He added that the songs from Shin Yun's vocalists were inspiring. You know, uh, I was inspired indeed by the English uh, titles on the music that was sung. And then when you realize what you're singing about, the tradition, um, the um, uh, faith tradition of, hey, we are only here for a time. Earth is not our home forever. Uh, we didn't come from here, and we will, and we will leave here. And that is a a very inspiring message that came through in in the songs, and I appreciate that. Many appreciated the traditional Chinese culture that Shen Yun presents, as well as how it shines a light on modern-day problems under the Chinese Communist Party. Well, the heartfelt of of the sorrow and some of the suppression of, of, of human dignity that's going on in China, but then the celebration of life and the jubilance of, of, of the seasons and the beauty of the country, and it's, it's very poignant. This is a performance that everyone should enjoy and learn from. There is, there's so much richness in the performance and in the message. NTD News, Nashville, Tennessee. The Super Bowl is coming up. As the Kansas City Chiefs and Philadelphia Eagles gear up for the game this Sunday, here's what Eagles quarterback Jalen Hurts has to say about preparations. Regardless of everything that's going on externally, you want to go through your, your, your normal routine and your normal process. And, you know, I think every team, every year, that, that process changes. So I think for this team, um, I think for the habits that we've created, I think for the habits that I've created being, a, you know, starting quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm just going out, going along with that process, keeping everything routine and um, kind of being, being present, being in the moment. For Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes, the week leading up to the big game is familiar. He led the Chiefs to a 31-20 win over the San Francisco 49ers in Super Bowl 54. Yeah, I think the Super Bowl I won, uh, I just learned how special it is to have a team that really believes in each other and can, can overcome obstacles. I mean, we, we were down every single playoff game that year, and to be able to do that, it was special. And then the loss, you learn that you can't take things for granted. You can't 
you can't come to a game and not have every box checked. And I, they, I thought we did, but uh, we d obviously we didn't, and we were, we were able to lose that game, and you had to use it as motivation to get back to here. Mahomes added that he has tons of respect for the quarterbacks of previous errors who laid the foundation for him, and he hopes to inspire the next generation of players. After announcing his retirement again, Tom Brady now says he will launch his career in broadcasting in the fall of 2024. The seven-time Super Bowl champion gave that update Monday while reiterating his NFL playing career is over. Colin Cowherd, host of FS1's The Herd, asked Brady if there was a, quote, 1% chance he would take back his retirement decision. The 45-year-old Brady responded in part, quote, It is hard to make decisions like that, but it is certainly the right time. Many had expected the record-breaking former Patriots and Buccaneers quarterback to get into broadcasting sooner. Brady explained that he wants to be fully committed when he starts as a Fox Sports NFL analyst and that, quote, decompression is important. A meeting of 3,660 Muay Thai boxers performed a mass traditional Muay Thai ceremony in Thailand, beating the Guinness World Record for the largest pre-fight dance ceremony. The ceremony is symbolic of showing respect to teachers, parents, and ancestors. A respected professional Thai martial arts champion led the boxers in the ritual. A Guinness World Records judge said the previous record for this title was 250 people, less than a tenth as many as those at this ceremony. Muay Thai is a competitive sport known as the art of eight limbs. Boxers are allowed to strike opponents with combinations of legs, knees, elbows, and fists. February 6th is also known as a Muay Thai Day in Thailand, held in honor of Thai king known as the Tiger King to mark his coronation in 1702. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.